Okay, welcome to some new physics problem solving. Today we're going to do some problems involving forces. So let's start with a very simple force problem. So this is the problem that uh, I'd like us to think about uh, for this first problem. Let's imagine that we've built a tree fort on the top of the physics building and we want to get some gear up there. We have physics books and Oreos and popsicles and who knows what that we want up there. And so uh, we don't want to do a lot of uh, work hauling all the gear up and so the way that we're going to get it up into the tree is we're going to tie all of the gear onto a rope. We're going to run that rope up over a pulley and we're going to tie on the other side of the rope a very large mass and then we're just going to throw that mass off of the tree fort. It will fall and it will pull all of our gear up to the tree fort for us. So if the weight of the gear is 62 newtons and we tie an 80 newton rock to the other end of the rope and we throw it off the roof, the two things that we want to know is what is the tension in the rope and what is the acceleration of the gear. Now, uh, as we've talked about, one of the things we're going to keep in mind is that a good approximation for most ropes that we encounter is that they are um, inextensible, they don't stretch, and so all of the forces along the rope are the same everywhere. And so we call these magic physics ropes because they don't stretch and they don't uh, change tension along the rope. And so the secret of solving ropes uh, problems in physics is that the assumption is that the tension is the same, that is the same magnitude, everywhere in the rope. And so if you can find the tension anywhere, um, then it's equivalent everywhere else. Okay, so let's bear that in mind as we solve this problem. So the first step in solving all problems is to draw a physical diagram to kind of show you the setup, something very similar to the picture that we have here. Okay, and from the physical diagram we will use uh, the description of what's going on to draw our free body diagrams, which we'll use to motivate Newton's second law and the force equations that we're going to solve. So the physical diagram is that we have two masses. Let's call one mass mg for our gear a rope that goes up over a pulley and it goes down to some other mass let's call it m sub r for rock okay so there's a pulley up here the pulley is not going to play a role in this problem all it does is it changes the direction of the rope so that the forces uh, can reach both masses Okay, so the problem uh, is set up so that the two things that we care about are the two masses in the problem. So let's draw a free body diagram for each of those. I'm going to define a coordinate system with plus y upward. Okay, so um, I define my coordinate system so that when I write down Newton's second law, the minus signs that I use in the equations are indicators of the direction that the force is pulling so that when I add forces together I can tell whether or not they are making a greater force or whether or not they're opposing each other and reducing the force. Okay, so in this case our free body diagram for our gear has two forces on it. There is the weight of the earth pulling down on the gear. We're told that number. It is 62 newtons. And there is the tension of the rope pulling upward on the gear. Now in this case, uh, our assumption is that the gear is accelerating upward uh, because it's trying to get to the roof. And so the consequence of that is that the net acceleration on the object should be in the upward direction. So the net force on the object should be in the upward direction. And I've tried to indicate this here probably not so well uh, by drawing a sl slightly longer arrow in the upward direction. Okay, so the other free body diagram is for the rock that we threw off the roof. And so the free body diagram for the rock looks very similar. There is the weight of the earth pulling on the rock and we're told that that is 80 newtons which we could use to find the mass and again there is the tension in the rope pulling upward on the rock. Ok, 
Okay? Now at this point, there are several things about the problem that we can discuss. Okay, so uh, these things will make our life easier when we write down Newton's second law. And what are those things? The first thing is the fact about the ropes. So ropes have the same tension everywhere. The fact that this rope goes over a pulley doesn't change uh, the fact that the tension on this side is exactly the same as the tension on this side. And that tension appears in both our free body diagrams. It appears here as the tension of the rope pulling up on our gear, and it appears here as the tension of the rope pulling up on the rock. And if the tension is the same everywhere in the rope, that means the magnitude of those two tensions has to be identical. And so I'm going to actually uh, explicitly state that and introduce a new value that I use in place of my indexed values. So the tension of the rope on my gear is equal in magnitude to the tension of the rope on the rock. And so I'm going to call both of those capital T, some number that represents the magnitude of the tension. The other thing that we can do at this point is we can realize that the motion of these two masses is intimately connected. So the easiest way to convince yourself of that is to think initially just about speed. If the gear is moving upward at a constant speed of one meter per second, that means every second one meter of rope finds its way over the pulley and is lengthening this side of the rope by one meter every second. The consequence of that is that the rock falls at a speed of one meter per second. In a very similar way, if this gear is accelerating upward, the amount of rope every second that goes over the pulley is increasing. And so the amount of rope that the rock finds between itself and the pulley is also increasing as a function of time. And so if the gear is accelerating upward at some rate, then that means the rock is accelerating downward at the same rate. So the way I'm going to impose that is I'm going to say that the acceleration experienced by the gear is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction to the acceleration felt by the rock. And I'm going to call that quantity a without a subscript because it has the same magnitude even though it's a different direction it has the same magnitude for both of the objects in the problem okay so i'm going to use those two important facts when i write down newton's second laws now newton's second law is that the sum of the forces the net force on any object is equal to the mass times the acceleration that that object experiences but uh, that statement of Newton's second law is generally written as a vector, and we know that it is also true for the components in any force problem. Well, in this case, the components in the problem are pretty straightforward because the problem is actually a one-dimensional problem, and so the only components I care about are the vertical components, the y components. And so Newton's second law, written in just the y components, is that the sum of the forces in the y direction for any object is equal to the mass of that object times the acceleration in the y direction. Okay. Now we've said that the acceleration that both of the objects we care about is just a, and so I could write this as the mass times the acceleration a. So let's write that down for both of the objects. Okay. So the first part is easy. So for the mass of the gear, I can write the mass of the gear times the acceleration, which is just a. And that is equal to the sum of all the forces. Well, this is why I draw a free body diagram. The free body diagram tells me what the sum of the forces are by inspection. The sum of the forces are a force in the upward direction, a positive force, that's the tension, minus, in this case, a force in the downward direction, uh, a, ne a negative force. And that, in this case, is the weight, which is known. So here in Newton's second law, I will write this as tension pulling upward minus the weight of the gear 
pulling downward. Okay? I can write a similar equation for the rock. I can write that the mass of the rock times the acceleration the rock experiences is a tension pointing upward minus the weight of the rock, which I'm also told. Okay? Now this is a system of two equations. And in this case, I know everything except for two quantities. The things that I know are the weights. Those are told to me. And I, in principle, know the masses because I can get the masses from the weights by dividing the numerical value for the weight that I was told by 9.8 meters per second. And that will tell me the masses. So in principle, I know the masses. And so I'm left with the things that I don't know. I don't know the acceleration, which we're calling A, and I don't know the tension, which we're calling T. So in this case, I have two equations and two unknowns, which is an algebraic system that I can solve. So to solve this, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for A in both cases. So from the mass for the gear, A is equal to the tension divided by the mass of the gear minus the weight of the gear over the mass of the gear, which is just the acceleration due to gravity. Similarly, if I write a quantity for the rock, I write that A is equal to tension divided by the mass of the rock, and again, minus the acceleration due to gravity. Okay. Now, at this point, I want to simultaneously solve the equations. So I set up here at the top that the acceleration of the gear is equal to the negative of the acceleration of the rock. Well, here I have an equation for the acceleration of the gear and an equation for the acceleration of the rock. And so I can impose this statement by taking this equation and setting it equal to the negative of this equation. So if I do that, I can write that t over to mg minus g is equal to the negative of this equation, which is g minus t over the mass of the rock. So if I do a little algebra, I can get both t's on the same side of the equation. So I get that t over mg plus t over mr is equal to 2g. If I get this over a common denominator, this looks like t times mr plus t times mg all over mr times mg is all equal to 2 times the acceleration due to gravity. This factors into t times mr plus mg, all divided by mr times mg. This is equal to 2 times the acceleration due to gravity. And so finally, I get my tension is equal to 2 mr times mg times the acceleration due to gravity, all divided by mr plus mg. So that is my final answer for the tension. Now, that's a lot of algebra, and when you get to the end of a problem like this, you may be wondering, did I do that algebra right? And we all make mistakes. You've seen me make several in the course of this uh, 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 course. And so we have to develop techniques to convince ourselves that, in fact, we've done something right. Well, we can do that here by checking our dimensionality. So first of all, Tension is a force, so it should have units of newtons. And newtons have units of mass times acceleration. 
So if I look at the units on this side, this has units of kilograms times kilograms, that's for the MR and the MG, times the units of G, which are meters per second squared. And that's all divided by the bottom, which is units of kilograms. So if I look at my units there, what I see is that one of the kilograms on top cancels with one of the kilograms on bottom. And what I'm left with are units of mass times units of acceleration, which are newtons. And so this is indeed exactly what we expect. This is a force. So that was the first thing the problem asked for. Uh, you can get the acceleration now at this point because up here we started with an equation for the acceleration is equal to the tension divided by mg minus the acceleration due to gravity, and you can algebraically substitute this tension into that equation to find the acceleration. Okay, so I'll leave the numerics for you to do on your own. Good luck, and I'll talk to you next time.